I'd been invited to a wedding, the union of Indian royalty in the old princely state of Rajasthan. A once in a decade experience of pageantry and splendor, I'd been reliably informed. And the most appropriate way to get there, the palace on wheels, night train to the former kingdom of Jodhpur. Welcome on board, sir. Thank you are you. welcome in Palace on Wheel. This is the Jodhpur Saloon, and you are the Honorable Maharaja of Jodhpur. Now I will show you your cabin and coaches. Please come. Thank you. The palace is strictly boutique tourism, a reproduction of the regal Maharaja carriages that once crisscrossed the Raj. These days, it's a fantasy ride for wealthy tourists, watching the third world slide by through the prism of a champagne glass. The palaces are beautiful, the art is beautiful, the people are beautiful, like they're always dressed in the saris, even the women working out in the fields. There's some things you've never seen before in your life. You know, you can go, we've been all over the world, but this is going to be different. This is going to be completely different. In fact, far more different than any of us had imagined. We'd set out to explore how former royals had reinvented themselves as living tourist attractions. Instead, we would find a real-life saga, more akin to an Agatha Christie murder mystery. But all that lay at the end of our odyssey, into a world of power and privilege. The work of giants and angels was how that great chronicler of the Raj, Rudyard Kipling, described it. Maharanga Fort, rising out of India's western deserts, ancestral seat of Rajput warrior kings who ruled this land for 700 years. It dominates the blue city of Jodhpur. Like many of the clan cities of Rajasthan, colour-coded to distinguish it from the pink and gold cities of rival kingdoms. Somewhat less martial but equally imposing is the home of the present Maharaja, the magnificent Umed Bawan Palace. Today, Gaj Singh II, the 37th Maharaja of Jodhpur, is hosting a royal wedding. Five hundred and sixty-five princely families once ruled a third of the subcontinent under the benevolent eye of the British. At India's independence in 1947, they lost their kingdoms. Then in 1971, as India veered towards socialism, they were stripped of their titles, lands and generous state pensions. Today, there's still plenty of resentment from those born to rule. From being a, pers a sort of special, uh, exalted person, one became sort of persona non grata, which meant that the whole bureaucracy worked against you. The politics works against you. And that made life uh, rather difficult. But these days, life is rather good, and no expense is spared for the Hindu tikka ceremony, a men-only engagement ritual. The groom is the crown prince of neighbouring Dungapur. Father of the bride is Sunda Singh private secretary to the Maharaja of Jodhpur. And this is opium, highly illegal in modern India. But as we'd later discover, these are people used to getting their way. The former warrior kings of Rajput aren't about to break tradition for anyone. 
after the engagement we exchange opium. Now exchange opium means confirm of a treaty. Once there's a treaty, you sign the treaty from the both party. If there's no signature in it, here you offer a opium and they give you back, means it's now confirmed. And everybody's happy and relaxed. Yes. Everybody is happy and relaxed, and now we the ceremony is over. In the evening, you will have you will see the wedding ceremony. The excesses of the old Indian royalty were legendary, and Umed Bawan Palace stands as one of the last great monuments to that age. It took 3,000 workers 15 years to complete this Art Deco fantasy in 1943. 82 year old Shova Kenwa saw it all. These days, she's unofficial royal family historian and mentor to everyone from the Maharaja down. She insists the palace was built upon a foundation of altruism, a massive job creation scheme. Chilpo went through his first drought and famine in the 20s. And at that time, after his Maharaja's grandfather, Maharaja Mesinji, was the ruler. When he wanted to give money in the sectors, where he thought financial help was needed, the people themselves said, we don't want charity. Give us work and pay us for it. And that is the main reason this palace was ever built. Stripped of their kingdom, titles and income, the Jodhpur royals managed to hang on to the palace. In the 1970s, it was partly transformed into a luxury hotel, complete with live-in tourist attractions and exotic wardrobe. But Jodhpur, not surprisingly, is the home of the famous riding apparel of the same name. I would say, Mark, that this is perhaps the only palace hotel which is still a palace. Because if the royal family are living here, you can say they're living in their own palace. Over in the next wing, the wedding guests gather for an informal buffet lunch. Tradition is relaxed, so the non-Rajput women can join the men. Business is combined with pleasure. And this is as much a networking session for royalty who've made the transition from absolute rulers to businessmen and hoteliers. The Jodhpurs, regarded as the elite of the elite, their image and reputation unassailable. But already, many people gathered in this room were aware of a dark secret that had the potential to undermine the whole edifice. No one dared raise the scandal in the Maharaja's presence. Instead, talk turned to family success. Well, most uh, royalty are now looking into business aspects, uh, whether it be turning their sort of assets into properties and resorts, or displaying their sort of artifacts in terms of museum and archaeology. And these are two aspects of business which were sort of thriving around in this part of the world. Shivraj Singh is the crown prince of Jodhpur. Educated at Eton and Oxford, this heir to the throne is reputedly one of India's most eligible royal bachelors. It's a misleading reputation, for he intends following the royal tradition of entering into an arranged marriage. These days, a touchy issue on the subcontinent. Not long after this wedding, the Crown Prince of Nepal would make world headlines by massacring his family, apparently unhappy with his parents' choice of bride. The Nepalese royals can trace their ancestry and traditions back to the Rajputs. But with this Crown Prince, there's not the slightest hint of anger or resentment. Traditionally it is uh, arranged marriages, that, that's how we, 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 we follow. It is to do with astrology, my grandmother and my parents will obviously find someone who's apt to the family. And then I get a choice, I'll get to meet her and if I say uh, I don't see myself being compatible, I can say like, listen, I don't think it's going to work and uh, we take it from there, but it will be arranged. <laughs> The wedding night, and as the groom is led to his bride, 
commoners line the route to pay their respects. The princes may have lost their absolute power of life and death over these people, but they've gained formidable economic clout. In a city dependent on tourism, the Maharaja of Jodhpur is the biggest business in town. The groom is guided through to the women's section for the final ceremony. It's an increasingly rare display of harmony for such a large gathering of royals. A number of these families are engaged in bitter internal squabbles over money and property. At 3 a.m. they finally emerge as man and wife. The bride, 32-year-old Princess Subhagia, a Swiss-trained hotel functions manager, now weighed down by tradition and family expectation. Next day, it's back to business for Shivraj Singh, the bachelor prince of Jodhpur. I think it's definitely um, the whole thrill of sort of being on, on, on a beast twice your size and the whole adrenaline rush of being on the ground and being able to put that ball through the post. The renewed interest in Indian royalty has now made it politically acceptable for the Jodhpurs to revive their sport of kings. Now with tourism coming in, in, into the scene, we want to use it as a, as, as a tourist attraction and maybe invite teams to come and play, which in other terms exposes the land to them and um, Jodhpur as, as a destination. Within the, the country, we want to be appreciated to who we are, who we are born to be, and uh, hopefully we'll be accepted for who we are and not always constantly pressurized and, and uh, fingers pointed at. A somewhat prophetic remark. Just days later, the dark secret was finally revealed in this expose splashed across the pages of a prestigious Indian magazine. Bridge Raj Singh, minor royal, polo player and stable manager with the Jodhpur team, had been found dead in highly suspicious circumstances some eight months earlier. His battered body found in this palace lake entangled with a blue sari. Several young royals, including the Crown Prince and Sunda Singh's own son Vikram, were named by the magazine as suspects. Pointing the accusing finger, the dead polo player's mother, Mira Singh. He was uh, looking after the horses of uh, Gat Singh and plus he was playing in the polo team. He's, my son is here and this is one of the boys uh, who's one of the suspects. This is the one. But Mira Singh is more than just a grieving mother. She's also a detective with the multinational private investigation agency Wackenhut. After interviewing several witnesses, she claims to have overwhelming evidence that her son was murdered at the drunken lakeside party. There was uh, this uh, girl, the Rina Singh, whom my son was uh, teaching riding. And uh, apparently some of these boys, uh, they teased her and we upset Rina Singh a lot. So she called for my son and told him to tell these boys to lay off. And uh, one of the boys amongst them said, Ki, from where has this servant come? Come in between, in Hindi. And uh, they started hitting him. Sunda Singh, far more sober in dress and mood, came forward as royal family spokesman to refute the allegations. Well, people who know us, they know that is all rubbish. This is all made up a story by her. Uh, by Meera Singh, the mother of a, 
uh, unfortunate uh, person who died, Prijaraj. The royal family version of events has Brijraj accidentally banging his head before staggering down the steps and jumping into the lake, despite the warning shouts of party goers. He jumped in the water with just enthusiastic, and you know, he had a couple of beer, and might be that had created, made him to jump in. Sundar Singh, who'd hosted the party, insists he'd left with the young princes before the incident. I can assure you with a word of honour that they were not at all in this, in a, an unfortunate incident. Shivraj Singh was not in the party, my son was with me and he was not there at the time of the death. I don't think anyone in their right mind would jump into this lake at 2 o'clock in the morning. It's so claimed by the police and the boys who were there at that time. Well, I would not like to even talk to uh, that label because she is not uh, above board a woman. She has no character of a woman. Most is to make money, blackmailing. The credibility of the police in investigating the case has also been seriously questioned. They hastily declared death by drowning before all witnesses could be interviewed or a full autopsy completed. According to Rohit Paraha, the India Today journalist who broke the story, given the list of those allegedly implicated, there's no doubt that police are involved in a cover-up. The police have acted in a highly unprofessional manner. And from the royalty side, yes, I would say that the kind of statements they have been given are totally contrary to the evidence which I have been gathering. Money is the power of to today. I mean, you can see it everywhere. So these people have the money and they have the power, but that's all they have, I'm sorry to say. By and large, royal families of Rajasthan do enjoy a certain influence. They have political value also. The Rajasthan High Court has now ordered police to renew their investigations. But it's unlikely the case will ever be resolved. There's simply too much power and prestige at stake. A lot of uh, powerful people, people are involved in this and this incident, uh, when it comes out, which it will come out, will be a very embarrassing factor for the royal family of Jodhpur. The royal reputation may now be tarnished but it's likely the scandal will only add to the allure of Jodhpur for the legion of foreign tourists in search of the mysterious past. However, for many Indians, there'll be no romantic illusions about their cultural heritage. The case simply reinforcing a perception that former royalty remains a protected species, with the Rajput warrior kings replacing war horses with polo ponies as they set off in pursuit of the tourist dollar. <laughs>